Now I'm really going to talk about um, the developing brain. And, and so, as I said earlier, your brain is constantly developing. You know, some animals, when they're born, their brain is fully developed. But the human is not. So it's constantly developing up into mid-20s. And during puberty is a really important time because this is when the brain is making a decision, what are we keeping and what are we getting rid of? So some neurons that are chosen to strengthen by myelinating them, and other neurons are cho chosen to be pruned. And so there's a lot of stimulatory neurons going on during adolescence, like um, the glutaminergic and, the, and dopaminergic. And there's a lot less of inhibitory neurons. And as I said, they're mostly in the prefrontal motor cortex, this thing like this that calms things down. And <clears throat> so that is why a lot of kids go through periods of anxiety, depression during puberty. That is a normal part of development. And I think we rush too quickly to try and medicate that. I think the purpose is to try and support kids through that period of time because it's a normal part of development. And so this is why this is such a high risk time for developing an addiction because they're stepping on the gas all the time, very little ability to step on the brake, and there's decreased parental monitoring, which you want, uh, and then there's increased peer affiliation. And I think that's the only place parents can really intervene because you really need to know what your kids are doing and who they're hanging out with. So then we have this endocannabinoid receptor system. And this is actually the best thing that has come out of legalization of marijuana, is our better understanding of this system. We did not really even know why people liked marijuana until the 1960s, and that's when this lab in Israel, and I think we didn't know because people just didn't pay attention to it. They said it's just marijuana and who cares. And, but there was this lab in Israel that was taking apart the different cannabinoids and injecting them into animals. And they found that when they injected THC into rhesus monkeys, they became calm and sedate. And then they discovered there was a receptor that THC fits right into. And that's how it got called a cannabis receptor. And I'm really sad that ever happened because that makes people believe we have receptors in our brain that says we're supposed to smoke cannabis. But that isn't true because it's that same lab along with other people around the world in the 1990s discovered why we have those receptors. And they discovered that we have this thing now called the endocannabinoid system. And this is our homeostatic system. It says our mood regulation system. So this is something that we naturally have. And they found that there are two chemicals that they've named 2-AG and anandamide. Anandamide is a Sanskrit word for supreme joy or bliss. So this is basically our happiness stuff. And what happens in our brain, the brain makes a decision when we need these chemicals and when we don't. So if we need the chemicals, we have the enzymes to make them, and they're made immediately, they're made locally, they're used immediately, and then they're destroyed because we have enzymes that destroy these chemicals. And so this is our own natural mood regulation system. THC is a fat-soluble substance that sits in that receptor and doesn't allow your own natural anandamides to work. And so that becomes a problem because these receptors play a very important role during puberty to determine what are we pruning. So what, what neurons are we going to get rid of because they're causing interference? This is a really excellent webinar, and I encourage people to watch it. This is a phenomenal researcher who's at Mount Sinai, and she's looking at the intergenerational effects of marijuana on the developing brain. And so she talks about how the endocannabinoid system plays a role in the entire development system. And she didn't say this in so many words, but what I got out of her research was no one should be smoking marijuana unless you're 25 years of age or older and you never plan to have kids because it affects the gametes. So it affects the ovum, the sperm, and so then that affects the developing brain of the offspring. So this is the synaptic pruning, and there are two receptors responsible for this. One are the nicotinic cholinergic neurons. It is not called nicotinic because we're supposed to smoke tobacco. 
It's just that nicotine works on these receptors. And so those receptors and the CB1 receptors, the cannabinoid 1 receptors, are responsible for the pruning of the brain. And this happens during adolescence. So the nicotinic cholinergic neurons are all in the reward pathway. The CB1 receptors are everywhere in the brain. And one of the problems is, is that THC has a stronger binding capacity to the receptor than our own natural anandamide. So it can then prevent the, our own natural system from working, which may explain why we have research like this. So this is, this is out of Europe where they looked at high school students who have used only one or two times compared to kids that never used cannabis. And they found that the kids that use cannabis had greater gray matter volume in these parts of the brain responsible for learning and memory. Gray matter volume are neurons. So that to me means these kids didn't get pruned like the other kids got pruned. And maybe this is why we have this kind of research. This is a very long prospective study looking at over a thousand people who they picked up at 13 before they were using any kind of substances. And then they followed them until they were 38. And they found that the people that never used marijuana had a pretty stable IQ over that period of time. Those who used marijuana persistently, like regularly, daily, had a drop in eight points in their IQ, which is pretty significant if you think about the average bell curve being 100 and you drop eight points, that's a pretty significant drop. And then this group has continued to follow these people. So this is brand new data they published where they followed them to age 45. And the interesting thing is what I've highlighted in yellow. So the long-term cannabis users had a drop of 5.5 average IQ points. The non-cannabis users didn't have a drop at all. And then this is compared to long-term tobacco users, which can affect your intellectual capacity but it wasn't nearly like marijuana. And then alcohol, which we think of as the worst, was actually better than tobacco or cannabis. For recreational users, had a pretty significant drop in IQ. And those who quit, their IQ didn't respond, come back. So that's kind of scary. And this is part of the problem because when we legalized marijuana in Colorado for medical purposes, the highest potency was 5% and we had no concentrates. So concentrates didn't show up until like 2010. And now we have these things that are 99.9% .9 pure and people are smoking with blow torches. Marijuana has been around for centuries and always up to about the 1980s. The average THC potency was less than 3% but it has continued to increase, and now the average potency is 20% in the plant. And you know we have these huge things that have no research on them for medical purposes, and yet they're sold as medicine. If you increase the, potent the um, concentration, potency of a drug, you increase the addiction potential. We know that about all drugs. We've definitely experienced that with the opiate epidemic because Codeine is not nearly as addicting as Oxycontin or as fentanyl. And so the more powerful the drug, the more addicting it is. And we absolutely see this now with marijuana. So alcohol is like the number one drug used by most people. And at any one time, you could estimate that 90% of the population have tried alcohol. However, only like 10 to 15% actually ever develop alcohol dependence. People can ship heroin. You don't have to get addicted to heroin. It's a much higher addiction potential than alcohol. The drug that has caused the most addiction to date is nicotine. And nicotine is the one that kills people. It just takes a long time. Uh, and so nicotine has been the most difficult drug for people to quit. And in my treatment program, that's what everybody would say, because we're tobacco free and they're going, it is so much easier to quit heroin than it is tobacco. However, what I'm seeing now with the high potency THC, it's identical to tobacco. In fact, it's even worse.
I find people that just cannot quit no matter what they try. And so they need inpatient treatment to be able to be away from it so that they can experience a time you know, where they can actually quit. But the problem is insurance doesn't pay for inpatient treatment for cannabis use disorder. I mean, most people are still looking at it like, well, it's just, can't, it's just marijuana, you know, that shouldn't be a problem. People should just quit it. But I, I'm finding that and NIDA is supporting that. So NIDA is saying that one in three people who use the current marijuana get addicted to it. Um, you know, if you're using before the age of 18, you really are susceptible even more to the addictive potential. And we definitely see a withdrawal syndrome, and it's pretty marked, and it can last for some time because it's fat soluble and it can sit in your fat and leach out over time. Um, I, I had people in my program that were still spilling out THC in their urine um, a month or six weeks later. And I know they're not getting it because they're in a very controlled environment. And so, it, and, and I was seeing really serious withdrawal. I mean, people are miserable. Like they're really irritable, they're really angry, they're really anxious, they can't sleep. And we don't have any medication that works for that. There's nothing to help with that really. And then we have this risk for psychosis. And this is one of the landmark studies that was out of UK that looked at high potency, which they call skunk, so it's anything higher than 15% THC, and they found that the people that were using it had a three times increased risk of psychosis. If they were using it daily, there was a five times increased risk, but if they were using stuff that was less than 5%, there was no increased risk of psychosis. And I think that's why we haven't seen that until now, because we didn't have all this high potency stuff but now we do, and so they replicated this study in multiple sites around Europe and in Brazil, and they found the identical outcome except for it was 10% or higher. And in the medical literature, supporting medical treatment for using marijuana, none of the studies show any benefit, well, they haven't studied anything greater than 10%. So all of the studies that support its use in medical is less than 10%, and all of the studies that are showing problems are greater than 10%. So really the cap should be 10%, but nobody's going there because the industry fights that tooth and nail. Because the industry is really, this is an, an industry that depends on addiction, no different than the tobacco industry, the alcohol industry and even you could say the pharmaceutical industry, um, because they need people to be addicted to it to buy their product. Marijuana is a hallucinogen, so it can cause psychotic symptoms in anybody, but they're usually mild and transient. So somebody could be really paranoid when they're using and then they stop using and it goes away. Or somebody could use and have a hallucination, like they see something that nobody else sees or they hear something nobody else sees. That's transient and that's considered normal. What first episode psychosis is, is when somebody is using a substance and then all of a sudden they have a totally altered perception of reality. And so they're, they're kind of stuck in a, in a situation where they are seeing things that nobody else sees or they're hearing things that nobody else sees. They're extremely paranoid. They get extremely delusional. And that's what I was seeing in my program, was with the increased potency, I was seeing worse and worse psychotic symptoms, you know, that were hanging on. And then what, you know, what you have to encourage people to do is they have to quit. And so that's called first episode psychosis because it's a pretty psychotic, it's, it's a bad situation, but it is time limited potentially. But then they have to quit. And the problem is they don't quit and then it can become permanent. And so then somebody can turn into having schizophrenia, which is a really devastating illness because it's not going away. 
And, and so this is a study out of Denmark where they were looking at, well, if the high potency is really causing our problem, we should be seeing it because we definitely have higher potency products. And so they did this huge population-based um, study looking at over 7 million individuals, and they definitely saw that. So there was a significant increase in cannabis use disorder and the diagnosis of schizophrenia in their population. And then this is uh, speaking to what you were talking about, because all drugs of abuse can cause psychosis. They all have the potential. Alcohol can cause psychosis, cocaine, methamphetamine. I have even worked with somebody who became psychotic from too much nicotine. However, what is the conversion rate to schizophrenia after somebody has a psychotic episode? And this study shows that marijuana, cannabis, is the number one drug that increases the conversion to schizophrenia. So almost 50% of people that developed a cannabis-induced psychosis then went on to schizophrenia. That's really scary. And I've had that experience with numerous patients. I had one young gentleman who was 20, and um, he was dabbing, and he developed a severe psychotic episode where he became very violent, and he tried to strangle his mother, which was totally against his um, character. So he was hospitalized for two months, and it took two months to stabilize him. Nobody says he's in the psych hospital two months anymore, but he required three antipsychotics to stabilize his psychosis. And then he was discharged and I ended up following him up. And I get the medical record and they can't believe this is just marijuana because the only thing in his system was THC. And so they were pretty sure they must have missed something that caused this. But they didn't ask the right questions. And so when I got him, I said, what were you doing? And he admitted he was dabbing. So he was dabbing this really high potent stuff. And he was, he was stable. So he was no longer psychotic, but he had horrible symptoms from his antipsychotics. So he had a really terrible ekathesia, which happens with antipsychotics where you cannot sit still. So it was up and down, up and down, up and down. So I agreed to take him off, so we slowly tapered him off his antipsychotics, and he was doing really well. And I gave him this lecture about never go back, never use it again, but within a month or so, his parents had brought him back, he was psychotic again, and I said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, well, I went back to dabbing. <coughs> he ended up developing schizophrenia, and that's really, really sad. And this is just a brand new study looking at um, global drug surveys, so this is around the, the world, just showing that um, the higher potency plants and the higher potency concentrates are really causing people to have more psychotic symptoms, and they estimate that actually one in 200 people who, who use cannabis may have a psychotic episode. That's kind of scary. And these are all the other consequences that we are seeing in Colorado, and that I'm sure you're seeing too, from these high potency products. Uh, and I don't want to go into all of them in depth, but if you have any questions about them, we definitely see increased violence. Um, this cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, do you all know what that is? Because that's just bizarre. It's, a, you know, it's an idiosyncratic reaction to cannabis. Cannabis is supposed to help with nausea and vomiting, but what we're finding with the higher potency, which is causing people to use more addictively um, and using regularly, then they're getting this opposite effect where they have severe abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting that they cannot control. And, and it's been coined scrometing because they come into the emergency room screaming and vomiting. And we don't have medication that help. The normal things you use for nausea vomiting in the emergency room are things like odansetron, and it doesn't touch the nausea. So what how people have to have is they have to get Haldol, which is a major antipsychotic with a lot of side effects, but it's used for people with chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting, and it does work for that. So people are getting put on Haldol just for cannabis-induced you know, vomiting. 
And people are getting full medical workups that are costing hundreds of thousands of dollars, trying to figure out what is causing their abdominal pain. And the solution is to quit using marijuana. But it's very hard to convince these people that that marijuana is causing their problems. And so that's what I spent a lot of time doing, is trying to educate people about that. And then, again, the, the biggest problem, people not being able to quit, and then what do we do with that? So I had a young lady who, uh, she was uh, discharged from the hospital to, for me to follow up on. She had been in the hospital with a very serious suicide attempt. And <clears throat> she was diagnosed bipolar and put on a bunch of meds for bipolar disorder. And so I'm supposed to follow her bipolar disorder, um, her medications. And so when she comes to see me, I do a thorough history, and I don't get a history for bipolar disorder. She doesn't fit it at all. And I said, I don't think you have bipolar disorder, but what happened with the suicide attempt? And she said, I have no idea. I've never had thoughts of suicide. It just came out of the blue, and I really felt like I had to kill myself. And so then I'm trying to find out, well, what would cause that? So I'm doing a more thorough history than they did in the hospital, because they didn't ask her these questions and they didn't do a drug screen. But I find out she's using 60% vaping, 60% hash oil every day. And I said, what is that for? She, oh, that's my medical card. That's, I, I use that for my migraine headaches. And I said, are you telling me that a doctor actually told you to vape 60% hash oil? She goes, well, no, he just gave me the card, and it's the bud tender that told me to do that. So we have bud tenders with no medical education that are, you know, practicing medicine without a license. But I said, so I said, you know, I think that played a role in your suicide attempt because there's so much research out there now showing its links to suicide. So I gave her all these articles to read about cannabis and suicide. And she then said, I think you're right. I think this is what caused it. I need to quit. And I said, yeah, sure, you do. Can you? And she said, oh, yeah, that should be easy. So I see her in follow-up in a month, and she has not been able to quit at all. She's been trying and trying and trying. What do I do with someone like that? Because there's no place to put her. I mean, there's no inpatient. There, there's nothing to do with that. Um, and so that's just really sad. So I do believe that recovery is completely possible from addiction. Uh, I just think that there's a lot of things that need to happen to help somebody do that. And I really think that treatment should be tobacco free. I mean, it should be all substance free if at all possible. I mean, I have used, you know, some of the medications we use to support people like Suboxone, Methadone. But I think we need to be on the lowest dose possible for those so they don't, you know, kind of do what I just talked about. I think you need to give the brain a chance to heal. And neuroscience has shown that it takes 90 days for a stem cell to grow and differentiate in your hippocampus. So once you stop using substances, your hippocampus can totally recover. AA has known this intuitively forever. So if you think about what AA tells people, right? If you want to quit drinking, you need to go to a meeting every single day for 90 days, 90 and 90, and then you're going to start getting it. And that works. However, the reason why AA doesn't work for a lot of people, in my opinion, is because it, it ends up being a cup of coffee in one hand and a cigarette in the other hand. And so they're still shrinking their hippocampus. I think that's why it's hard for people to get a handle on what they need to do, and they have to keep doing it over and over again. Then you want to promote exercise, because that increases neurogenesis, so it, there should be voluntary exercise. And then you want to rewire new neurons, because you've got 100 billion neurons in your brain. Each neuron has over 10,000 connections. When you learn something new, you just use a few of those neurons. They get wired together, and then they fire together. And so you want to wire some new neurons together so they become your go-to neurons. So that instead of just, because my example is, people can sit in jail for a very long time where they can't get anything. And you would think that would cure them, but it doesn't cure them. 
if they haven't done anything to rewire their brain, this is why I believe there should be treatment in incarceration. So jails and prisons should have an intense treatment program, but they don't. Because you have to wire new neurons. If you don't, what happens is all they do in jail is talk about connections. They talk about who they use and where they go and what they do. And so when they leave jail, even if they've thought to themselves, you know, I really feel so much better. I'm not smoking. You know, I'm not using drugs. I should continue to not do that. They walk out of jail, they walk by the 7-Eleven, and their brain goes, cigarettes. And they go in and get cigarettes without even thinking about it. They run into their dealer, and without even thinking it, they make a buy because all that has been hardwired in there, and they haven't wired anything new in there. And you gotta remember that putting the drug back in your body just stimulates those neurons to work again. So the drug actually drives the behavior because that's because the drug has hijacked the brain and it drives the behavior. And this is why then people have difficulty learning anything new. We do have these medications, but they should be looked at as an aid. They are not a standalone treatment. And so lots of places are just thinking these are standalone. We have a lot of jails that are putting people on Vivitrol the minute they leave jail. Great drug to help somebody stay away from opiates. But if you haven't taught them anything and they don't learn anything new, the minute it wears off or they can't get another shot, they um, go right back to doing what they were doing. So we have these medications that are helpful but they are an aid. They should not be used as, this is the goal. So we have, you know, these medications. I, I only use a nicotine patch. I don't use nicotine replacement of any other form in my treatment program, mainly because they're all very addicting because they engage the prefrontal motor cortex. The patch is not addicting. It, it, it puts nicotine in your system that helps with the withdrawal. But the, you know, the gum, the lozenge, they're extremely addicting. And so I've had to use the patch to help people get off the gum. We don't have any pharmacologically treatments for um, marijuana. There are some companies working on that. They're trying, trying to come up with a um, medicated-assisted therapy, kind of like Suboxone for marijuana, but they're not available yet. There is this drug that's available over the counter that actually has research on it. And I never got to try it myself because I could only use FDA approved substances in the state hospital. But um, I, I recommend people try this. You just have to do a high dose of it. And it is available over the counter to help with uh, marijuana withdrawal. But these are the things that have to happen in treatment. And these are the things that I used in treatment. And these are the things that I will kind of go into. But you kind of have to have a healthy diet we didn't have a healthy diet at the state hospital because they gave us minimal amounts of money for it. We got like 18 cents a day per person to feed three meals. But we got a $2 million um, pharmacological budget for drugs. <laughs> um, and so that's how I got into micronutrients. I actually really support using those and, and have um, used them with patients in place of psychiatric medication. And so all of these things, I'm being told I have to quit. So uh, we'll move on to this, the next section.